As Russian forces maintain their advance in Ukraine towards the nation's capital, Kyiv, it is difficult in this digital age to wade through the torrent of misinformation we as consumers are being subjected to through social media each day and the media. Rebecca Koffler is a Russian-born US intelligence expert on Russian doctrine and strategy. She explores the role of misinformation in the Putin regime in her book, Putin's Playbook. She joins us now. Rebecca, great to see you. How are you? So wonderful to see you. Great. How are you? We're, we're very well. Now, tell us about your book, uh, Putin's Playbook, and tell us it's pretty timely. Uh, you know, he, try, he, he waited for your book to come out and then he invaded Ukraine, I think, so that, you know, sell copies of your book. I'm just being uh, uh, cynical, obviously. Um, tell us about what you think Putin is up to. Well, as I described in my book, uh, Putin gradually, methodically is executing his playbook. What is Putin's playbook? It's a top secret plan that consists of five instruments that are intended to destabilize Europe and reconstitute a supranational alliance, not unlike the former USSR. And basically, Putin is executing right now. The Putin's playbook is unfolding right in front of our eyes. When I wrote the book, I didn't realize how fast he's going to try to implement the playbook. Rebecca, uh, just tell us, before we do more on Putin, just tell us a bit about your background, how you were born in Russia, when you left and went to the States, uh, and, then we'll, and just tell us that story because it's fascinating. Of course, Ron. So I was actually laughing as you were showing uh, Ronald Reagan and the jokes that he was uh, telling. It's right on target. This is exactly correct. I was born and raised behind the Iron Curtain, right, in the former USSR. And yes, socialism is just not all about the free stuff. It's a totalitarian government control system. When everything is free, nothing is available. Okay. <laughs> That's a good line. Absolutely. Yes, you uh, you would go to the store and uh, the best case scenario, you would find three things there. Bread, sausage, and milk. On the worst case scenario, you will find nothing and you would need to go the next day and the next day, okay? Because those people who are in power, they have access to everything. They shopped at different stores. They were treated at different hospitals. They could travel abroad. The rest of us had nothing. So I came to the United States. I fled, you know, because my mom raised me with the idea that eventually she wanted me to go to America, the land of freedom and, and, and opportunity. Opportunity. And so I fled in 89 and I came to America only to find that socialism is chasing me here. And just like you said in your other episode, I am terrified right now about the prospect of this country transforming from a free capitalist society into a totalitarian socialist nightmare. James. So you've written this book, Putin's Playbook. He is obviously executing a uh, big play in Ukraine right now. Now, two questions for you. Number one, did he miscalculate uh, how hard or easy it was going to be to decapitate the gov government in Ukraine? And if we've got this playbook and we have an idea of what he's thinking now, what are his next moves? So, yes, James, I believe he miscalculated the Ukrainians people will to fight. And yes, with Putin being a former KGB officer, this is an intelligence failure. But overall, he did not miscalculate in terms of the West's response. He has been studying and his military and his intelligence services, they have been studying the way that the West, the United States and NATO conduct wars, and they have discovered that we have vulnerabilities, such as our reliance on technology to conduct warfare. And so they've also discovered that we don't have a counter plan. So from that perspective, he feels very, very confident that he is gonna achieve his strategic goals, 
which is the reversal of the outcome of the Cold War. And his next step is going to be basically resubjugated every single post-Soviet state beyond Ukraine. Moldova, Belarus, Georgia, only the Baltics are safe at this point by virtue of them being NATO members. So this is his end game. And these are his next steps. Rita. Well, I'm wondering how successful that plan is going to be if these economic sanctions really take a hold. Can he pursue this strategy if the funding is cut off? Economic sanctions will hurt Russian economy, but they will not change Putin's behaviour. They will not stop him from trying to implement the master plan, which he has been hatching for 20 years, Rita, mm. right under our nose, because these are two different things. His security concerns of Ukraine potentially becoming a NATO member trumped manifold econ any economic concerns that uh, the West can potentially, you know, uh, damage Russia economically. Because remember, as we just spoke, during socialism, the Russian people suffered so much more, you know, economically than any sanctions can really um, can, can, can damage um, in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, making things difficult, you know, uh, uh, supply chain and all of those things. And besides, Putin has actually been sanction proofing his economy since 2014, since the first sanctions uh, hit Russia in the aftermath of Putin chopping off Crimea off of Ukraine. James. Tell us just a little bit about this Russian mindset and mentality about Russia needing to be a great power on the world stage, its historical terror of invasion, especially coming from the West. How is this informing Putin's playbook? And are we in the West being ignorant about what Russian history, culture and essentially identity is when we try to push NATO up to the boundaries of Russia? Yes and yes, James, uh, you are absolutely correct. Uh, Russian history and national identity that is wrapped up in the notion of exceptionalism absolutely drive Putin's mindset and serve as key factors to him developing the playbook and executing. As you pointed out, uh, Russian history is just full of wars and, and turmoil. And most of the wars, with the exception of the Mongol Tata invasion uh, dating back to 1238, most wars came from the West. And so the Russians actually, by doing intelligence assessments long term, uh, 50 years out, they have concluded that a war between the US and NATO and Russia is inevitable because they <coughs> notice that we are fighting over the same territory. The current conflict is not about Ukraine. It's about who is going to call the shots in Eurasia. And they know that the United States has been pursuing a bipartisan long-term policy that is intended to prevent Russia from dominating Eurasia. And so Putin has said once, if you know that a fight is unavoidable, you must strike first. And here we are, he's striking. And unfortunately, we're not fighting back because we ignored all the signposts uh, indicating to us what Putin was up to. And we didn't develop a counter plan. Rebecca, I want got Two questions for you. One, what is the level of support for Putin and his actions in Russia? And two, would he ever follow through with his threat of using nuclear weapons? So, Rita, the um, excellent question on the support. Uh, it's complicated. Overall, right, um, Putin's support is traditionally very high. This is why the Russians have uh, elected him four times. Generally, his uh, approval rating ranges from in the 60 to 80%. Uh, before 
the invasion of Ukraine, 69% of the Russians approved Putin's actions. His support is lower among the young people, about 46%. About 49% of Russians support the idea of resubjugating the eastern Ukraine, the Donbass part, including with military means. Yes, there is a segment of the population that is anti-war, and there are demonstrations. Will it change Putin's behavior? No, because he will suppress all of those uh, demonstrations and protests and will give jail time to the protesters regarding the nuclear um, question. This is actually very, very dangerous. The moment that we're living in, one wrong step, Rita, on either side, and we are in a nuclear confrontation. Why? Because again, Putin has done his homework and on his orders, a very sophisticated nuclear doctrine was developed and he holds advantage right now in tactical nuclear weapons. He knows this. And so if he perceives that our actions are offensive instead of defensive, he can activate a preemptive doctrine. So the chance of miscalculation on either side, right, either United States, NATO, or Russia about what's going on on the ground, um, and which is very uh, easy to do in the fog of war. And then we are in a completely different scenario here that risks World War III. Well, on that note, Rebecca Koffler, um, we'd love to get, we'll get you back again in hopefully in a few weeks' time to chat again because your insights are just uh, fantastic. In the meantime, people can buy your book from Wilkinson Publishing here in Australia, A Putin's Playbook by Rebecca Koffler. Um, and thanks so much for coming on Outsiders and uh, uh, an awful, uh, scary time for us all. Uh, thanks so much, Rebecca Koffler, and keep safe there in the States. And we'll speak again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And all prayers to the Ukrainian people.